Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and it is a great privilege to be here on the 30th anniversary of this really important international festival. We've heard some very interesting things so far from Verbier, from Singapore, and from Hong Kong. And I want to talk this afternoon about something slightly different, which is a building and what the influence of an art centre can be on the cultural life of the city, how it's connected to the past, the role of art centres and festivals in creating a new festival and a new future for the arts. So I will take our work at the Barbican as the focus so you can see how that is developing and then look further afield to the role of the arts in the city. Because the Barbican Centre is a unique site in the City of London. And the City of London is not what we call all of London, but the single square mile at the heart of that wider city, the ancient Roman settlement where London began. And as you can see, looking down on it, the Barbican Centre is a unique, bold and ambitious urban area. Perhaps one day the West Kowloon district will look like this, who knows? And it was created after the Second World War in response to a special situation in the city, because the northwest of the city was almost totally destroyed in the war. St Paul's Cathedral famously survived, but you could walk half a mile from St Paul's and not see a single other standing building. And the city made a very bold decision to rebuild on a completely new basis a utopian vision of a residential estate with the arts at its core. The construction, which you can see here, was a long and very expensive process. My predecessor, Henry Rong, the first managing director of the Barbican, oversaw the building works. And I always say that it took three decades. It took the 1950s to decide to build the Barbican, it took the 1960s to plan how to build the Barbican, and it took the 1970s to build it. And so by the time it opened in 1982, it was really quite unfashionable in terms of this modernist style and its brutalist concrete. But the architects were actually pioneers, and in the three decades since the centre has been opened, it's grown and grown in public estimation and is now regarded as a real classic of the genre. Here you see the residential towers, which are at one time the highest in Europe. And the range of art facilities that it provides is also remarkable. The large concert hall here, seating 1,900 people, presents classical and contemporary concerts. Its resident orchestra is the London Symphony Orchestra, and its associate orchestra is the BBC Symphony, with many international guests and performers. It's superb for many kinds of music, though it has always been something of a frustration for us that it's not quite large enough in terms of volume and resonance. It doesn't easily accommodate a choir, and there is no organ. Uh, then, here there is the theatre, uh, designed in collaboration with the Royal Shakespeare Company, who were the first residents there and have recently returned for seasons of work. It seats 1,200 people in a rather unusual layout with these side doors to every row and an uninterrupted swathe of seating. There are many other spaces within the centre, a major art gallery, or a smaller curved gallery, a smaller pit theatre, and the remarkable conservatory on top of the building, which is a green space used for meetings, receptions, commercial events, weddings, and perhaps soon divorces. Um, there are three cinemas, two of them recently just built outside the main centre, and increasingly, we are finding that outdoor work, as has been described earlier in Hong Kong, is a really important way of drawing in new audiences who might never have thought of crossing the threshold of our art centre. This uh, event in King's Cross brought a programme of African music we had toured around the country, and this is a real important development to return to. But our arts programme, gathering, as you can see, all the art forms under one roof, 
also aims to be as broad as possible in its scope. In the visual arts, for example, uh, our recent exhibitions have ranged from an exploration of the Bauhaus School, a really important uh, exhibition, uh, to the world of James Bond films, designed as a touring exhibition of popular appeal, which has been around the world, in, uh, uh, including, remarkably, for the spy-based world of James Bond to Moscow, where it was very much enjoyed. But if there's a single quality that we strive for at the Barbican, it is art without boundaries. To push the frontiers of the art forms and take them forward, like the work seen here of Peter Bausch in dance, Robert Wilson and Philip Glass in Einstein on the beach. Uh, besides our resident orchestras, we have a group of international orchestras with which we collaborate regularly, from America, the New York Philharmonic and the Los Angeles Philharmonic. From Europe, the Leipzig Gewandhaus and the Concertgebouw from Amsterdam. We also include jazz at Lincoln Center with the inspiring Wynton Marsalis as a regular guest associate. Now, these ensembles undertake residences. They don't just give single concerts. And in between their series of concerts, they work with children and young people, giving master classes and engaging with communities. This is expensive and it is labor intensive, but it is really important because the audience then builds a relationship with these performers. Uh, uh, much as we were hearing at Verbier, there is a relationship with those international orchestras and uh, ensembles and individual artists who commit. And the same applies to our contemporary music programme. We set them up to engage new audiences and listeners in participation and involvement. This urban classic gave young performers the chance to perform with members of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. Our building, which was so controversial, is now part of our resource. And as an iconic building of the late 20th century, it's used for photo shoots, fashion displays, films, advertising, and is a serious commercial contributor to our overall balance of payments. And we agree with this quote that more than half a century after it was conceived, it is truly the vibrant and successful part of the urban landscape that its architects envisaged. I was trying to think what here in Macau might draw audiences who are going to the casinos to come to an arts event? Well, here's a suggestion. Rain Room. This was one of the most innovative exhibitions we mounted, uh, a miracle of science and technology by which you enter a room where it is pouring with rain, but as you move around the room, it dries up above you as you walk. People queued for hours and hours to experience this unique experience. In fact, the queuing became part of the event. <laughs> and we mounted artistic events in the space. This is the famous dancer Wayne McGregor's dance programme, which came in to Rain Room to perform. You didn't need to know anything to experience this artwork and yet it made an incredible impression on people. Similarly too, with our work off-site. People want an artistic experience these days, they can help to create something that all ages can share. So what is going on here? This is a huge illusion created on the streets of East London by the, architect, by the artist Leandro Ehrlich. It's actually a model of a Victorian terrace house laid flat on the ground with a huge mirror to reflect it above. So what you think is the house is actually a reflection of what is going down on the ground, enabling people to hang from the building, uh, spread themselves around the building. And this attracted a, a huge number of passers-by with no particular knowledge of the arts to experience this and was probably the most photographed and Instagrammed installation in London for some considerable time. Uh, and remember that East London also is home to more artists and arts organisations than anywhere in Europe, but it also remains one of the most economically deprived areas of the UK. 
Here's another example of participative technology. Uh, this exhibition called Digital Revolution showed how interacting with digital arts can create new forms and functions driven by the audience. These were all interactive pieces made by the audience as they passed by. For instance here, waving their hands created these huge wings which moved around and gave young people and audiences an incredible feeling of creativity and power. This is another installation of great sophistication which responds to what people do to it. So with digital culture, the iPod, Spotify generation don't recognize genre boundaries in the same way. They are open to new ideas and collaboration, stimulating a license for artists and arts organizations to try new things. Children can make these spaces their own and also release their appetite for creativity. Our creative learning work, which we undertake in collaboration with the Guildhall School of Music and Drama next door to us, shows how people want to participate and create, uh, rather than be just passive consumers. Uh, when I say passive consumers, I don't argue for a moment against the experience of listening and paying attention to great music or to a Shakespeare play. That in itself is participation. But there is a sense of involvement which we recognize on a daily basis now. Here too is another mix of genres. Live dance by Merce Cunningham, staged in one of our exhibitions, bringing the art forms together animating the spaces of the art gallery and bringing those exhibits to life in, in a live way. And we have done that with various exhibitions, including one around Philip Glass and Trisha Brown, for instance. Boundaries are dissolving. The mixing of the art forms will be critical for the future. Uh, if you wonder what this is, this is a group called Circa, performing extraordinary acrobatics while a string quartet plays the Debussy string quartet in the background, uh, bringing a whole new perspective to that piece. You wouldn't want to necessarily hear it that way every time, but it is a stimulating illumination. The artist Anthony Gormley and the choreographer Hoffe Schechter collaborated on a mixed media show involving a hundred London young people. They were able to work with professional artists who are part of the Barbican setup, uh, Boy Blue Entertainment, and that combination of youthful vitality with professional help and assistance realized a show which was on our main stage. It wasn't an education venture, it was a show in our main theatre, receiving five star reviews and standing ovations. It's enormously labour intensive but we felt it was a really important way forward. Digital and audience involvement will be one of the ways of the future, even in the most serious theatre pieces. Here is Roman Tragedies by Ivo van Hover, which brought together three Shakespeare plays into one compelling evening but set it up in a whole new way for the audience. The audience was able, in the course of the evening, to come up and sit on these sofas. There was a bar here, uh, reading material over here, as well as screens above the stage. You could move around freely while the action took place for two-thirds of the evening, and then Towards the end of Antony and Cleopatra, uh, you all gathered again in the auditorium to experience the climax of, of this compelling work. But Ivo van Hover is one of the great theatre makers of our day, and we have been very, very lucky to work with him and to present three of his shows in this coming year. So that's just a snapshot of the artistic flavour of the Barbican. But where is the Barbican in the city? It's very interesting to look here and see 2,000 years of history outside the Barbican. The Roman Wall, some of that revealed by the Blitz, 
the medieval church of St Giles Cripplegate where John Milton is buried, and the Barbican residential towers, bringing together ancient and modern in an extraordinary way. And this happens all over the square mile of the city. Here you have a, a, an isolated church tower by Sir Christopher Wren, a contemporary building by Norman Foster. And I only have to walk out of my office and there are buildings by Foster, Richard Rogers, Terry Farrell, Eric Parry, alongside those ancient remains uh, and a Roman fort buried underground. A remarkable coming together of old and new. This avant-garde building was built just outside St Paul's Cathedral as the city's information centre. And it's also the way from the Millennium Bridge. Just by St Paul's Cathedral, as you can see, is a, a new shopping centre designed by Jean Nouvel, an increased retail offer with public space, pushing visitors onwards into the city. And this raises, for me, a very, very interesting question for the future. What do we want our buildings and our art centres to look like in the future and to feel like in the future? Are they welcoming and accessible, or are they daunting and off-putting? And it's not a simple question. If you look at the great buildings of the past, Let's not criticise the cultural structures of the previous century. They were built for a different age. But this was built for people who wanted to feel special and exclusive, who wanted to feel that they owned in their understanding of music and opera things which mere ordinary people did not own. Uh, here's another magnificent example in Vienna. And you think we had maybe moved away from this approach to buildings for the arts, but they're still at it. Here is the remarkable opera house by Henry Larson in Copenhagen, probably one of the most expensive opera houses ever done, uh, built on a prominent site in, in Copenhagen, which has been extremely controversial and, and is actually quite inaccessible. And uh, some of you may recognize this, which is the new concert hall in Hamburg, uh, which has spent many, many years getting designed and getting built and will finally open in February next year. It's by the firm of Herzog, uh, January next year. It's by the firm of Herzog, uh, Herzog de Moiron, who brilliantly transformed Tate Modern in London. Uh, the question of how separate this feels from everything that goes on around it is something I, I think we need to think about. London has got much better at integrating its spaces for the arts and, and culture and creating good public space. This courtyard of, of, of the wonderful building Somerset House used to be, as you can see, a car park for uh, the Inland Revenue uh, tax people who worked in the building. Now it's completely transformed into a public space with fountains, open spaces, and in the winter, uh, an ice rink, which has become an absolute social centre in New York. In South Kensington, around the museums, the, the road that links all those museums has been transformed into a shared space now for pedestrians and cars with a much greater sense of connection between the different organisations. Um, our colleague Art Centre on the South Bank has become transformed into somewhere, from somewhere where you had to really struggle through the concrete and the puddles in order to get to your dose of Bruckner in the Festival Hall to something which is a far more inclusive, welcoming and open place. Uh, and it's full of people enjoying themselves. So what does this mean in terms of how we orientate ourselves in relation to the rest of London? Uh, this relatively recent innovation is the Millennium Bridge, which stretches from Tate Modern down here up to St Paul's here. It was open in 2000, then they had to close it again because it wobbled too much. And uh, since it has reopened, it's enormously successful. Uh, there are five or six million pedestrian uh, crossings of that bridge in the course of a year. And so we want to take advantage of that 
as a cultural venue. Here's how you, how you, you can see us, the Barbican, there in the north of the city, and how close we are, both to St Paul's Cathedral and then via the Millennium Bridge to Tate Modern, people coming along from the institutions of the South Bank, the Festival Hall, the National Theatre, uh, this way up to uh, the Barbican. But the problem is that at the moment they are not welcomed up there at all. There's no sense of direction or excitement. And yet how close we are to the tech city of Shoreditch with all its young start-up companies, the creative area of Clerkenwell. And in fact, we think really we ought to be the centre of the universe. Uh, so this, this is a, a, a map just showing how if you move outwards from the Barbican and its arts activities, you encompass a whole range of different sorts of activity within the square mile of the city, that's this, uh, and beyond into the neighbouring areas. And very important here, the new railway system, which is coming across the north of the city, which we call Crossrail, which will put new stations at Farringdon and over here at Moorgate and Liverpool Street, which promises to put literally hundreds of thousands more people on the streets. And we need to offer them an experience of arts and culture. So what are, what are we trying to do here? We have got together with the other cultural organisations of the city to propose a cultural quarter in this area of London. Now, a cultural quarter is, is nothing new. Uh, Singapore's thriving in terms of uh, cultural districts and many other important cities in the world are creating these things. But London has existed as separate artistic institutions. And the question is, what can we do together in order to make a different offer to people? <coughs> um, this started as a collaboration between the Barbican and the Museum of London, next door to us, but it is now expanding to include a whole range of cultural organisations. And the aims that we have come up with are very, very simple. Um, bearing in mind the arrival of Crossrail and new people, to create vibrant and inviting areas, not just the cultural buildings themselves, but the spaces in between. We have world-class venues. We want to enhance that experience. We want to coordinate the cultural offer, meet audience expectations, which are changing all the time, and in some way to showcase the City of London. Because there's a perception that what the City of London does is finance and business. That is what the reputation of the city abroad is. And yet there has been a whole cultural dimension to the City of London which has been insufficiently recognised. So uh, that's where I just... Um, uh, take slight issue with the idea that city branding is always a bad thing. Uh, I think it's possible if it grows organically out of the work of the different uh, organisations working together that it can be an extremely good thing. So we have here a whole range of different experiences we also have, very importantly, in the Barbican, a whole residential estate of people living here, uh, 4,000 uh, apartments in the Barbican Centre, which is a vital part of the whole setup. And uh, when you look what we can do, create a vibrant and exciting area, renew our visitor strategy, highlight these venues, enhance the, the resident and visitor experience, we can move forward in marketing and branding and selling the city offer. But it requires the, the RSC to work with the LSO, with the Guildhall School, uh, with the Museum of London, with the galleries of the area in order to create a, a unified picture. And what does it create? Well, this is what a consultant's report that we commissioned, much in the same spirit that Martin commissioned McKinsey's, had to say, 
that this proposal for a cultural district could create a less monocentric economic future for the City of London. Arts and culture have a key role to play, both as a net contributor in their own right, but also for their spillover role in improving the quality of life and the range of experiences available for those who want to live, study, shop, work, invest in, and visit the square mile. And that is a pretty comprehensive, pretty clear statement of the potential. And we would say, uh, incidentally, that post the uh, Brexit vote of earlier this year, which will significantly, uh, in ways that are yet to be determined, change London and change the UK, that this cultural future for the UK and for London and for the city in particular becomes even more significant as a way of attracting inward investment and attracting people who want to work with us. Um, now, unfortunately, there is a downside to all this. The area is ghastly, and we have got to do an enormous amount to improve it, because the urban realm was not really thought of uh, as a cultural quarter, and it is full of places which are confusing and off-putting, and the fact that the Barbican is difficult to find has been something famous for years and years and years, uh, and it's, it's only slightly less true than it was. So, for instance, a whole new wayfinding scheme has to be part of, of this new world. But we have so many different activities, whether it's learning, whether it's shopping, whether it's cinema, whether it's galleries, whether it's churches, whether it's heritage, and so on, to draw together <coughs> into this space and show what is available to people. And the art centres are welcoming millions of people to the city's attractions. Over two million people a year go through the Barbican Centre. Not all of them are coming to events, but many of them are. We promote over 3,000 events a year of one sort or another. The Museum of London, since we did this slide, uh, is way over a million visitors a year and has been re-enlivened by its new director. So there is an enormous amount already going on to build on. We are not creating something from scratch. We are organically developing what already exists. And there are plenty of possible um, examples around the world of what a cultural hub, a cultural quarter can be um, from uh, the museum's quarter in, in Vienna uh, to the uh, new Alice Tully Hall and Juilliard School in New York, Exhibition Road, I've also mentioned the Oslo Opera House, and all these are places and buildings which have a very, very different relationship between outside and inside from the great cultural temples uh, of the past. And we started to define what the characteristics of an area that could call itself a cultural quarter would be in a city. Because there's so much going on in London. There's so much to do. How do you know you're part of this? Well, you need a sense of welcome that invites you in. You need a sense of visibility so you know how to navigate your way around it. Uh, you need a sense of accessibility that it's easy to get into from the transport links and the bus routes and the tube mats that exist around it. Uh, and it needs to give you a sense of excitement, a sense of there being something special here. Uh, there needs to be support to make people want to stay, increase their dwell time, cafes, retail, and so on. And finally, it needs to point you outwards elsewhere to the other places in London and the other exciting areas where this sort of work is happening. So it's, it's a very, very enlivening idea and we are just at the stage, I wouldn't say we were there yet by any means, we're just at the stage of working out how we work together to, to bring this alive for people. And we've got a lot of connections to make the most of. 
because uh, here's the Barbican again, here are the new crossrail stations, up here Clerkenwell and Smithfield, up here a thriving uh, food market in Whitecross Street and LSO St Luke's their, their building and uh, over here Old Street and Shoreditch, the tech city that I referred to. And of course, down here, uh, we go to St Paul's, we go across the river to Tate Modern, and all the links with the Festival Hall, the National Theatre, and the Globe Theatre. So it, it is a very good part of London to be. And we want to draw into it the livery halls, uh, those are the ancient city halls which are completely unique to the city, the city churches, uh, I gather Macau has the greatest number of churches per head of the population anywhere in the world, I, I still think it might be worth just doing a measurement of that against the city of London with all the red city churches, uh, it's got amazing new buildings, it's got the Shoreditch design, triangle with the London Design Festival, it's got precious little open spaces, and so on and so forth. There, there is a sense of energy here which is pretty unstoppable. So what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve that people go from saying this, this is a rather daunting area, which those who know what goes on here can find, but is it really for me to say instead, say this, this is an attractive, welcoming area which invites people in, it's where I want to be. Uh, and that maybe we can move from this ghastly scene to something like this, from this unwelcoming facade to something like this that draws you in. And I think this is going to be the way forward for arts buildings, that <coughs> visual art is not just in the gallery, it's in the foyers, the entertaining spaces, uh, that there is a sense of excitement and involvement in all the spaces, not just in what happens in the halls. And I think this will be a meeting place, this will be somewhere for people to hang out and feel comfortable and feel unthreatened by the art that is on their path. Um, perhaps into the future there will be more temporary spaces for the arts. A highlight of each summer in London has been a temporary pil pavilion at the Serpentine Gallery in Hyde Park. This one was by Frank Gehry, uh, providing an extension to the museum but also an ornament to the park where people gathered to meet and enjoy themselves and there were concerts and events in this space. Just great. It's a model of what a space connecting the arts to the real world can be about. And there are so many other areas providing young people with spaces to create their own art. For instance, the Roundhouse in London has done that. Uh, these new interactive temples of art will be just as receptive to great art. It's not a tension between new and old. The Barbican foyers now are overflowing for post-concert events, informal gatherings, and uh, post-concert music. They can be a meeting place with great fun uh, and a great fun space. And the question for the future is how can we conceivably enlarge this wonderful and unique setting to provide the facilities that a new generation needs to interact with the arts of the future. And I'll just leave you with the, the fact that we do have one extraordinarily ambitious scheme up our sleeves which we want to create for the next generation and it received a, a very considerable political traction. And that is the idea that we could build a new concert hall and centre for music for London, not only a concert hall, those are the terms they understand in the London papers, which is great, but a centre for music with a whole education and digital facility, the sort of work that we were hearing about from their BA, uh, when 
Simon Rattle returns to the London Symphony Orchestra as its music director next autumn in 2017. The planning for this will begin in earnest. And if anybody in the room happens to know anybody with £200 million, please see me afterwards. Thank you very much. Good afternoon again. Um, first, first of all, I cannot tell you what a great pleasure it is to be here. Uh, thank you to the Macau International Music Festival for the invitation for organizing this. Um, and thank you for putting me here now to respond to this. I, it's, it is an enormous privilege. Um, and I'm gonna sit down before I get too excited. <laughs> so Nicholas, you've given us in a very short space of time, a, an amazingly comprehensive overview of what's happening in the Barbican from inception. And there's a lovely consonance there of 30 years and 30 years and 30 years of the Barbican's history, as well as this festival where we are at today. So many amazing themes were picked up. I was inspired from, from this morning, from Martin's presentation, and, and some, some of the things that you have said um, in the way of the best forums and discussions have picked up those ideas and reverberated. And I'm sure we will all take away different dimensions of what you have said. But for me, some of the, uh, perhaps the most, the, the two most important things is that we have moved away from festivals which are inherently peripatetic and transient, and very much about an experience of a short period of time, whether it's three days or 30 days, or a week or a month or 15 days or whatever, um, to a building, to a space. At first sight, that seems to be completely different paradigm, completely different way of thinking. But in both, this festival world that some of us inhabit, and the building world that you have talked about, it is really about the work that happens in it. It's really about the fantastic artists that we are able to present. Um, and, and just, you know, segging for, for indulge me for a minute, um, I was so thrilled to see Pina Bausch, I sat on the beach, you know, uh, circa work that we've also presented. So there's a wonderful feeling of collegiality, of, of us all being in this together and doing this together. But more than that, whether it's a festival, whether it's um, the space, whether it's from the first talk this morning and to this one, a lot of the concern has been about drawing people in, about making people welcome. Whether it's in the festival, whether it's a woman who says, what do I do now, what do I do, what do I do? How do I have this ticket, now what happens? to city planning, urban landscapes, much larger tracks, and making sure that we who love what we do and so deeply believe in the value and the validity that we draw people in as far as possible, we make them welcome, we make them comfortable, we take away the barriers. I love the words that you use. Welcome, visibility, access, and excitement. I mean, if this doesn't sum up what the performing arts ought to strive for with our greatest artists, with the greatest talents that we can find, that as, as administrators, managers, agents, facilitators, whatever, this, this is what it's about. So thank you for putting that so succinctly. I like particularly also the way that you think about the Barbican, of course as the center of the universe, we all are in the center of the universe, but also joining up what there is. I, for, for me, I, I think that very often in the day-to-day -day of running our own institutions and our own organizations, um, you know, whether we have a deficit, whether, whether the artist shows up, whether we can negotiate the, 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 the fee, you know. Th th there's so much of the nitty gritty, there's so much of, like, we need to do this, we need to get that done. That we really, if we can manage to focus on the totality of our own organizations, 
that seems like a big enough brief. But to take our organizations and to see where they fit in the environment, in the city where we are based, and to take that beyond even that immediate environment and, and to look at the, the, the ecology, if you want, the, the, the wider environment and to see what value we can, together with other players in the neighborhood, bring and offer as a new proposition. I think that's a very, very strong and a very compelling idea. And if we all take nothing else away from, from this forum, and I, I know we will, this is a really, really powerful one. The idea of showcasing London, the idea of saying, you know, the city of London isn't known really for its culture. It's, it's really about making money. I cannot tell you how much that reverberates with me, okay? We say this about Hong Kong all the time, all the time, all the time. But yes, in these environments which are not necessarily immediately most known for culture, and earlier somebody had said you stand in Macau and you look at all the casinos and you think like, what is this? You know, and you basically have a little crisis of cultural identity. It's actually all there. It just takes the leadership, the will, the vision, the, 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 the capacity to embrace more than what you do and to put this into a larger context so that you're leveraging and here's a financial word if there's, well, there's one, but you know, so that you're leveraging in a very positive way on what there is. And making, coming back to the idea of festival, even our center, um, this idea of making the whole much greater than the sum of its parts by joining it all up. So those are, those are my very you know, superficial comments in response to an inspiring presentation. Well, not at all. Uh, thank, thank you very much indeed. And let me just pick up uh, a couple of things there. I, I didn't want to be, in any sense, anti-festivals. Uh, I think festivals are incredibly important, but they're incredibly important in certain geographical contexts. And um, Martin was explaining very eloquently how his festival depends entirely on people making a decision to come to Verbier for a period of time and absorb themselves completely in that work. That really doesn't exist in London because there is so much going on so much of the time. And therefore, the traditional festival model, we feel, doesn't uh, apply so much to the range of work that we offer. Uh, interestingly, the South Bank uh, Centre, which is probably the biggest art centre uh, alongside Barbican in London, does use the word festival uh, a great deal because it has an inheritance from the Festival of Britain in 1951, which, which uh, set up uh, the site and set up the building of the Festival Hall. So they have uh, a large number of community-based festivals around which they gather their activity. But I think that's just n nomenclature, really. Um, so I think that the the... We're so different from how we were 30 years ago when uh, you could say that the classical music audience, for instance, was completely defined. It was a classical music audience in a box and they didn't mind what they had to go through in order to get what they wanted. And that was part of the reason why they would slug through the puddles and sort of slug past the concrete and put up with a less than welcoming urban environment to get to what they wanted. And there's a very interesting South Bank statistic that 30 years ago or so, and this is pretty rough, um, they had an audience base of 100,000 100, people who would come 10 or 11 times a year. They were subscribers to the Philharmonia and the London Philharmonic uh, and so on. Absolutely regular uh, attendance. And it only took 15 or 20 years for that to change completely into an audience of 400,000, which is a wonderful expansion of the audience, 
who came once or twice a year. And that is a very, very different pattern. And I think we're all looking at that now because uh, people have so much to choose from, particularly in the big metropolitan centres. They have a fantastic range of things to choose from. That's true. Um, I believe that it is almost time for um, Q&A from the audience. Yes. session. Here has come the Q&A session. Anyone would like to ask a question? Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much, Sir Nicholas. Uh, it's, it's a great presentation. I think uh, the ideas that you, you presented uh, with the rain room and also other uh, all sorts of different concepts are, are, are really very inspiring. Uh, I, I do have two very short questions. The first one, uh, you know, how do you turn? I mean, what, what, what are some of the, the, uh, the Barbican strategies to turn uh, the incidental uh, visitors to more purposeful visitors? I mean, you have all these uh, rain rooms. How do you make them into more permanent kind of visitors? Uh, the second question, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure you have heard of uh, John Hartley's Creative Cities, and there's always been a linkage of creative cities with uh, 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 like a, a culture district, you know, per se. Um, the, uh, what, what is your opinion of, uh, of creative cities and, and culture districts, per se? Thank you. The answer to the first question is you know perfectly well. You can't force them. Just because people come to one thing, uh, they can't be forced to come back for another thing. But what you have to do through skillful information and digital marketing, which we'll talk about tomorrow, is to identify the tastes of the people who come in quite a sophisticated way and then get in touch with them to offer something else that is in that segment that you, you know from their previous uh, attendance they have the potential to enjoy and all you can do is is offer it and for instance we would like to offer far more in the way of constant weekend activity for families in, in and around the center as a way of getting in making a new offer to a new group of people that's very labor intensive work uh, potentially quite expensive but it is something which we're increasingly seeing as a as a priority now. So I, I think that is really a marketing um, question. Um, creative cities, yes, that thinking has uh, uh, been a background to what we have been doing, uh, but I would say we're in a slightly different situation uh, from other cities that have created cultural districts from nothing, because, as I've explained, we have so much going on which we can build a cultural district around. Uh, there's now a very interesting group, I think we're hoping to meet in Singapore at some point, the Global Cultural District Networks, and that is exchanging really interesting uh, information, um, pioneering places like Montreal, which have created spaces for outdoor spectacles with special lighting and uh, amplification systems and public art and so on. Uh, uh, you're right to pick up on the fact that this is absolutely a thing of the moment. It's absolutely what a lot of people are thinking about. And what I think we as cultural people have to do is to persuade our city makers that this is one of the ways of the future. And that manic overdevelopment and expensive housing that nobody lives in and just invests in is a complete waste of time and space. Okay, thank you. Now I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Thompson to ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very inspiring and a timely talk, Nick. Um, very propitious for Macau at this moment. We're in Macau. We have more Catholic churches than anywhere else in Asia. We don't have any rent churches. But what could you suggest? We're sitting on the cusp of the world's largest metropolitan district, the Pearl River Delta. Nine cities, if you take in Hong Kong and Macau. What could you suggest from some of the key points you've made today to make places for people, to bring connections and communities together in the way that you do so very well in London at the Barbican? Well, I, I 
Kevin, I can't answer that in a moment, as this is my first visit to Macau. I really do not know the region well, but it strikes me on 24 hours experience that you do have some of the same opportunities that the City of London has that I described in this extraordinary configuration of new and old. Uh, and I think one of the challenges you must have culturally is trying to get that old and new to connect and that it is not just one audience who goes to the Catholic churches and another audience who goes to the casinos. You might set yourself the challenge of where's the common ground between the church and the casino. I don't know the answer to that. And, and on the bigger question, this is all to do with planning. It's all to do with city vision, and it's to do, perhaps the area you describe is too large an area to unify into one plan or, or one delivery, uh, but you, you have to work with something that is intelligible to people as a proposition. You know, there have been huge visionary plans for the whole of London that never quite seem to work because they can't communicate with everybody. What we hope we're doing here is we're working with an area that is small enough for people to understand and yet uh, an area which has a huge significance. And so if we can just communicate that one thing about what goes on there, we will feel we've got one step forward. Okay, thank you so much. 好，跟住落嚟咧，我哋就邀請我哋台嘅觀眾發問最後一條嘅問題啦。Here is the last question. <音樂>有冇邊位觀眾係想提問嘅，或者係想發表你嘅意見咧，都可以噶。Anyone else would like to ask the question? Um. Okay. Actually, if there's nobody from the floor, I'm going to jump in because there okay. is somebody. Uh, there's something that's been on my mind. In in this macro view of of um, the, the the city, the, the urban environment, where do you place the artists in this development? No, that's that is a really good one. And uh, at the moment, I would say we have not got as integrated a picture on that as we would like, because one of the things that we're discussing a great deal is in order to create this unified idea, how much common content does there need to be, or is it simply a question of the individual organisations pursuing their their own routes? Now, within the Barbican, we have engaged artists, as I showed, in crossing the, the boundaries. Uh, for instance, we, the Barbican, now work with the Royal Shakespeare Company on outreach and, and education work because we have very much similar aims. But I think there's a big good question about how museum curators from the Museum of London can work with performers at the Barbican, can work with students at, at the Guildhall School. Um, my gut feeling is that actually a diversity in this field is really good because that adds to the richness and breadth of, of what we offer. <laughs>